welcome those who are watching online. Great group of ladies this morning. Glad to see you ladies here. We have some that will probably be making their way in, so if you hear the doorbell ring, uh, just know we've got some folks a little bit late. But open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11. And those of you who are watching online, um, welcome. Uh, in a few moments, we'll read from the New American Standard Version. And let me just say a word before we turn it to Gene Bundy uh, for prayer. Um, Dr. Darnell has said to our men's group, and we're going to say it to you ladies, as we read through this chapter, and you have a question about the translation, because your translation reads different than mine. Just ask a question, and we'll talk about why there's a difference in translations. Remember, the Hebrew Scriptures were written in what language? <laughs> Hebrew. <laughs> Hebrew, the language of the Hebrew people. And we'll talk about that here this morning. So, you don't read Hebrew. Uh, Doc reads it very well. I'm getting better at it. Uh, and... <laughs> If I read it and tell you what it means, Doc might read it and he might have a little bit different translation. That's what happens with the different translations of your English Bible. Okay? So, NAS is what I'll be reading from. Gene Bundy, it's all yours. It's me. Oh, very good. Don't be critical. <laughs> Prayer is no greater love. Nailed, nailed to a cross, Jesus gave his life so you could live. Amen. He died not to judge you or condemn you, but rather to forgive you. Through his sacrifice, you may have the gift of life eternal, a gift freely given, offered with no greater love. Will you receive his gift and his love? God demonstrates his own love for us, and this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A uh, passage from Isaiah 11, first chapter. A branch from David's line, out of the stump of David's family, will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, you want to tag somebody for next week? Karen. Your neighbor, what's her name? Karen Holland. Karen, Karen, you got Karen. it next week. Do you remember you had your you had your prayer sheet there on the table. And that's the tape right on there. I realize you have your own circles of family and friends that you share things with, but you're welcome to uh, share with us also on this prayer sheet, and we will intercede for you also. Very, you. very good, Gene. Thank you. And uh, yesterday was a very busy day. In fact, this week has been busy. Getting up very early. Uh, and, uh, he came for me to teach him Hebrew about sound of sleep. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Our sleeping schedules are a little bit different. He stays up all night, and I get up very early uh, in the morning. Uh, but... So we didn't send out, that's my fault, Gene, the prayer request and the reminder of today, but glad to see you here. And I'll try to do that every week, uh, but we just missed it this past week. Not your fault. Oh, well, well, you're kind. You're, you're humble? That means you'll be exalted, Gene. Here we go. <laughs> okay, let's do, let's do a review. And ladies, Rochelle, I realize I might be blocking a little bit of the screen. I'll, I'll do my best to step in and out so that you all can see. Um, to tie the Hebrew Scriptures together, we have to understand chronology. Chronology is like your backbone. It gives strength stability to your understanding of the Bible. Now, what is chronology? Chronos is the Greek word for time. To understand the Hebrew Scriptures, you have to understand the time in which events took place. Now, Edith has reminded me. Wade, 
I have a hard enough time remembering the birth dates of my grandchildren. How can I remember the dates of Scripture? And she's got a great point. A great point. But I'll just tell you, when you hear it over and over and over again, soon it becomes second nature. Okay? So I'm going to give you a few dates as we come to Isaiah 11. And you'll understand why chronology is important when we come to read this chapter. Now, in 1925 B.C., Abraham was called by God to leave Ur of the Chaldees, and I'll show you a map in just a moment, and move to a place called Haran. Now, he was 75 years old when God called him to leave his land. And if you ever think that you're too old... For God to use, just remember Abraham. Remember Moses. Abraham's walk as a leader of God's people began when he was 75. Which means, this is real easy for you to remember, he was born in 2000 B.C. Easy to remember. Okay? Do you remember Y2K? Y'all remember that? Everybody said the world was coming to an end. Banks were closed down. All that stuff. It's 2000 A.D. Okay. Just remember Y2K. And put B.C. before it. And that's when Abraham was born. Are you with me? Yeah. So 75 years old. He's called. Now let me tell you. Or let me show you. If you will. Let me show you where he came from. Ladies, I'll step out of the way. In, in fact, Bill, I think I'll come to the map pointed out, and uh, maybe you ladies over on this side, you can see a smaller map, possibly. Uh, ooh. What's up? All right, watch out. Don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was doing this on the uh, program the other day, because it's on my computer, and all my banking information came up <laughs> on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Sorry, Rochelle gives me the look, like... Okay, what? Uh, so hopefully that, that didn't happen today. All right, we'll do it again. Uh, all right. Let me show you where Abraham came from. Here's the map. This is really cool. Here is Earth. Here is Babylon. Here is Asser. Nineveh of Assyria. Most scholars believe the Garden of Eden is right here, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Ur is where Abraham lived. God called him to Haran, which is just north of modern-day Israel. To get there, he couldn't go this way because of why? Very good. It's the Arabian Desert. He couldn't go this way, so he had to go up the Mesopotamian Valley. And to get where he was going, he had to go up and then down. By the way, Israel is right here. So any attack on Israel in the Old Testament from the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Persians, always came from the north. Jerusalem was always attacked from the north because nobody could come from the west due to the sea. Nobody could come from the east due to the desert. And nobody could come up from the south due to difficult mountainous terrain. So they would always come from the north. Okay, now, Abraham comes and his family settles here. And you remember the great story of how one of his family members, Lot, Abraham, uh, they get there and God says, this is your land. And Abraham and Lot, they're looking and, and Abraham says, Lot, where would you like to go in this land? And Lot looks up and he sees the most beautiful area and he says, I want to go there. I want to go there. And Abraham very humbly said, okay, go. 
And of course, Lot's story um, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and I think there's a lesson there. Be very careful um, what you look for in this world because it can end up being a catastrophe. Uh, always keep your eye on the divine. Okay, now, when they came and settled in the land of Canaan. Well, it showed the picture, please, again, of Abraham. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Where's his pickup truck? <laughs> <laughs> there they are. Yeah. Little donkeys, boy. I mean, when I first went yeah. to Israel, there were donkeys running all Everywhere. over the place. Now they're not. They've they got, they got trucks. But, You're right, Doc. And it's, here's a young guy. Yeah. Is that Lot? Yeah. Yeah. And then and he's got Terah, his father. Yeah. Where is Sarah? Um, you know. That's her on the, on the donkey. Right yeah. There. Yeah. And. It's it's interesting, um, you know, Hazel, you said your friend is having a struggle walking, and she realized our trip to Israel, there'd be a lot of walking. Imagine living in the days of Abraham. Even to get water, you had to walk. By the way, I'll give you a little, ladies, I'll give you a little tidbit. You have two ovaries. Uh it was normal for women to have twins. It was normal. In fact, it's one of the reasons why uh, the population grew so quickly uh, in the days of Noah after the flood. Uh, pristine human condition. Uh, so twins were very, 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 very common. Except during harsh conditions of life, uh, the menstrual period would stop. So w it was not uncommon for women to be barren because they were walking so far. They were in the heat. It was a very difficult existence. So if you became pregnant, you'd have twins. But often there would be barrenness. Okay? And you'll read about barrenness in the Hebrew Scriptures, and, and the ancients believed it to be a curse. So the question becomes, if, if the lack of a menstrual cycle was common, and it was in Abraham's day, how did you know you were pregnant? It's not like today in the luxury of, of a home where you've got air conditioning and heat and you know, you're comfortable sleep on a soft bed and you turn on the tap water. How did a woman know she was pregnant in Abraham's day? Rochelle, how would she know? Quickening. Quickening. She would feel movement within her belly. And by the way, the New Testament picks up this word quickening and it is the word that is used for how you know a person has been graced or has come to faith in Christ, has been regenerated. There's movement spiritually. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins, he has quickened. He has made alive. So just a little tidbit. So Doc points out that it was a long walk. Okay, now, Abraham ends up dying and is buried in the land of Canaan. And his son Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel when he wrestles with the Lord. Israel has 12 sons. And you know the incredible story of one of those sons named Joseph, who is hated by his 11 brothers because they believe him to be the favorite of the father. And so they sell him into slavery to Egypt. By the way, Doc will make a little bit of fun uh, of me, but it's all good-natured and humored, and, mm -hmm. and he does it as well. <laughs> Joseph is probably the greatest type of Yeshua in the Hebrew Scriptures. Everything about him points to the Messiah. Everything about his life uh, sold out by his own brethren, you know, uh, misunderstood 
by his own people, exalted to a position of ruling, providing for his family every need they have. It's incredible. Okay, but Joseph goes down to Egypt, and look at this map again. Look at this map. Everything in the Hebrew Scriptures, you see right here. Abraham coming up here, land of Canaan, they settle. Then Joseph comes down to Egypt. Now it's interesting, Canaan, which was later renamed Israel, the land of Israel. Notice the crossroads that it's on. In order to get to Babylon or Persia or Syria from Egypt, you had to go through Israel. Or vice versa. Shipping, Tyre. Remember the island of Tyre. You may not know it was an island. It's like New York City. It's a Phoenician city. It's, it's not an Israeli Hebrew city. And in Ezekiel, we're studying the destruction of Tyre because the king of Tyre thought he was El, which means supreme God. And, and in our, in our uh, doc, in our study uh, yesterday with the Ministerial Alliance, uh, I basically said, anytime any city, nation, king, person, family think that they're El, there's the supreme God. How Judgment from Yahweh have? comes. Fifty. We had fifty. Fifty. Yeah. And you had a meal for thirty. <laughs> Somebody I didn't do very good reservations. That's yeah. That's what we hope would happen. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll see what occurs. So, all right. Any questions before we continue? You say, well, wait, what does this do? What does this have to do with Isaiah 11? Well, you're going to see. You're going to see. When Joseph's family comes down to Egypt at his invitation, remember Joseph has become second in command in the land of Egypt. He's in charge of food distribution. A family has come to Canaan, to Israel. So his family comes down and he feeds them. For a couple of centuries, Israel's family blossoms in Egypt. Until the book of Exodus opens up and the Bible says, there's a king in Egypt. And by the way, the word in Egyptian for king is Pharaoh. There's a Pharaoh in Egypt who comes to the throne who knew not Joseph. I'm quoting from Scripture. And so, this Hebrew people who have significantly grown in numbers a little bit like immigration today. A lot of our prejudice today against people is because they're not like us. We better be really careful because we're going to see in Isaiah 11, Yeshua looks after the immigrant. He looks after the oppressed and the poor. The Messiah is concerned for them, as we'll see. Okay, so the Hebrews now are the largest ethnic group in Egypt. So the Pharaoh who comes to the throne and sees them, you know what he does? Hazel, he makes them slaves. And he says, okay, we're building the pyramids. You make the bricks, you Hebrew people. And so the pyramids are built, um, the buildings of Egypt, on the backs of the Hebrews, until Yahweh calls one of his people named Moses. At the age of 80, to lead his people out of Egypt. Abraham 75 when he's called. Moses is 80. And do you know the story of how Moses leads them out? This map right here. The Hebrew people are here. By the way, the word Hebrew, Doc, what, what does the word Hebrew mean? Crossing? Hebrew, well, crossing. Going across? Yes, going across. Now watch. It means to cross over. A lot of people believe the word Hebrew comes from Abraham crossing over the Euphrates. Others say, no, it comes from the, the Jews, the Israelites, the descendants of Israel, crossing over the Jordan, crossing over the Red Sea, moving to Canaan. Others say, no, the word Hebrew comes from Ibir, who is the great-grandson of Noah, the grandson of Shem, and all of the Hebrews descend from a beard. Whatever, I think both explanations for Hebrew are right. 
It means to cross over. And the Hebrew people are constantly crossing over. So when they leave Egypt and cross over into the land of Israel, it takes them 400 years to conquer the Canaanites who live there. Now the question is, when did they leave Egypt? Abraham is called in 1925. Israel leaves Egypt in 1495. For 40 years, they wander in the wilderness. Now, when I was a kid and I heard the word wilderness, I always thought, Doc, they were playing cowboys and Indians and wandering in the trees. But wilderness in the Bible means desert. Wilderness. It is genuinely a wilderness. They wandered in the Negev Desert for 40 years. Now, why is that? Well, they couldn't go back to Egypt. Okay? The land of Canaan, remember the great story? They went to spy it out. They'd been gone for centuries from Canaan. So they sent 12 spies to spy it out. And they come back and they say, there are giants in the land. Giants. We can't take it. Remember that? Okay? So, Yahweh says, come on. I'm giving you the land. And the great story of how they cross over, you see it here. When they cross over, they leave Egypt, and you see this red line. They walk up through the desert on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Then they cross over near the ancient city of Jericho. And by the way, it's the first city they come to. Remember what they do at Jericho? Walk around it until the walls fall. By the way, little tidbit here. When they crossed over the Jordan in about 1450 B.C. 1450 B.C. When they cross over the Jordan, um, the place they crossed over is called Bet Araba. And it's interesting, that's where Jesus, the true Israel, that's where he was baptized. And so when we go to Israel, uh, just south of, of, of uh, the Sea of Galilee, Doc and Edith have uh, been with us. All the tourists, they, they baptize Sue uh, there just south of the freshwater lake called Gennesaret or Sea of Galilee. That's not where Jesus was baptized. you got to go south to Jericho. And by the way, the Jordan River is not pristine and pretty like you see on baptistry pictures. It is muddy. It looks like tapioca. Uh, it is nasty. And that's where we baptize uh, the people who wish to be baptized, at the very spot where Jesus was baptized. Okay, so for 400 years, they have to defeat the Canaanites to take over the land. And then this is where we're coming to Isaiah 11. In the year 1051, and this is very precise, and this is a date you should always remember, 1051 B.C., almost a thousand years after Abraham was born, the descendants of Israel become a kingdom. It's called the United Kingdom of Israel. They look around at the nations around them that have kings, and they say to themselves, we want a king too. And for 120 years, they have kings. Three of them. Saul. And by the way, why did they choose Saul? They chose Saul. Anybody remember? He was handsome. He was tall. He was strong. And they're like, that's who we want. By the way, it's like modern day politics. <laughs> it, it really is. And you know what? He was a horrible king. He was a horrible king. And then... David becomes king. David becomes king. You remember how David is chosen? David's a shepherd boy. He's from a peasant family. His father is Jesse. Never forget that because we're about to come to Jesse in Isaiah 11. Jesse's a peasant. He's a humble guy. Nobody knows Jesse. How why would you want a shepherd to be king? With me? But you know what? Yahweh had anointed David to be king of Israel. David becomes king from the family of Jesse. And then his son Solomon became, becomes king. 
Okay, and then as we have seen, 120 years after they become a kingdom, Israel divides into a civil war. Now people ask me, I think one of the men asked me on Tuesday morning, did they really fight each other? When they divided into north and south, did they really fight? You know, there were some skirmishes. In Isaiah 7, we saw one where the king of Israel was coming down with the king of Aram to take possession of the kingdom of Judah and to replace the king of Judah. So yeah, they would fight. Now, not all the time. It'd be sporadic like the Civil War of the United States. But it truly was a division. The capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. And when they became a kingdom in 931 B.C., this is the date, ladies, this is the date that I promise you every single person in your Sunday school class will never know. They will not know. But it is the date upon which much of the history of the Hebrew Scriptures revolves. 931 B.C. How do you get there? Three kings reign for how many years each? Which is a total of how many years? So now see, man, you're getting good. If the kingdom started in 1051, when did the kingdom come to an end? 931. That's the date. And then when you start reading Kings and Chronicles, then all of a sudden you begin to understand... Oh, wait a minute. The writer of Kings, the writer of Chronicles, is jumping back and forth, back and forth, between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And if you don't know that, you get really confused. Throughout the history of the northern kingdom, there are 19 kings, and all of them are bad. They worship other gods. In the southern kingdom, there are 20 kings in their history before the southern kingdom comes to an end. We studied this. This is important. The northern kingdom comes to an end in 722 B.C. From 931 B.C. to 722, they have 19 kings. When they come to an end, who conquers the northern kingdom? Anybody? Who said that? Very good. Assyria. Assyria is the world's first empire. An empire is a country that leaves its borders to conquer other countries, removes their kings, establish puppet kings, and gets taxes from the people they conquered. Okay. The Assyrians brought in men to intermarry with the Israeli women of the north. And these pagan men who married the Israeli women had half-breed children called? Named after the capital, Samaria. You go down 700 years when Yeshua is born... Yeshua must needs go through Samaria. The Jews of the south avoided the Samaritans because they were half-breeds, but not Jesus. He goes after the least, the littlest, and the lost. And if you ever want to find a good church, you find a church that is looking after the least, the littlest, and the lost. Okay? Very good. Now, Isaiah. Isaiah is born in 740 B.C. He is born before, or, or excuse me, he's not born in 740 B.C. He's called in 740 B.C. at the age of 21. He is born in 761 B.C., and that's on your card. In 740, in the year King Uzziah died, he is called to be a prophet. And the northern kingdom falls when he's about 40 years old. And so Isaiah, who lived in Jerusalem, in the capital of the southern kingdom, is warning his people, the Judites. The Judites. Remember, Judah was the major tribe of the south. And the only other tribe was Benjamin. Benjamin. Only two. Ten tribes of the north. They're called the ten lost tribes. Because when Assyria conquered them, they took the men out, and nobody knows where they are. They're lost. You know what? The Mormons... Say, you know what they teach? Doc, what do they teach? They came over here. They're they, 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 the Mormons will teach you that the Native Americans are the ten lost tribes. Okay? That's their official doctrine. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is, through some DNA analysis, which is very recent, a lot of the Cherokees on the East have Hebrew blood. Okay? So, there's always some truth... Uh, and we won't get into it, but there's, there's a reason why some of the men of the northern tribes uh, maybe eventually came to the North American continent. That's another subject. In Isaiah chapter 10, 
which we saw last time. Isaiah talks about the Assyrians who were now trying to take over Judah. Assyria fell. Hezekiah is king of Judah. Isaiah is related to Hezekiah and he's telling Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the Assyrians wiped out our brothers to the north and they're about to wipe us out. And Hezekiah is like, what do we do? And Isaiah says, we better repent or we're going to be cut down like our brothers to the north. And Hezekiah repents. Falls prostrate before the Lord. Pleads for his people. It's an incredible story that we'll come to later. And then in Isaiah 10, we saw it last week. Isaiah says to the Jews, listen, I know the Assyrians are at the gate, but let me tell you something. They're proud, cocky, tall trees. They're mighty soldiers and they think they are El. And Yahweh's going to cut them low. He's going to take the entire forest of Assyrians and He's going to bring them to stumps. By the way, He does. Through a pandemic. A pandemic. A plague. You see, any time a nation, a city, a people, a family think they're El, supreme, I did it my way. Forget you, God. I don't even care about you. I'll live my way, think what I think, do what I want, love what I love. Forget you, God. Okay, boom. The Lord comes with four things always throughout history. He sends famine. He sends pandemics. He sends war. And he sends sudden death. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Try to find eggs in Sam's now. <laughs> okay. Now, by the way, I'm not. I'm not scared. I'm more excited to be alive right now, Amen. Jen, Amen. than at any time in the history of the world, because I believe a great revival is coming, mm -hmm. because Americans are being humbled right now, mm -hmm. and it's just beginning. Okay. Now, you say, wait, what does this have to do with Isaiah 11? Isaiah 10 finishes up with Yahweh saying through Isaiah the prophet, I'm doing this, I'm sending judgment upon the Assyrians that they might truly rely on the Lord. I sent judgment on the northern kingdom of Israel that the remnant left behind might truly rely on the Lord. Now before we start reading Isaiah 11. Oh my goodness. Turn in your Bibles. Keep your finger here. I want you to turn to 2 Samuel. Chapter 7. I went through that entire history so that you can understand when David was king of Israel, he had a prophet in his palace by the name of Nathan. Nathan was the one that pointed out David's sin with Bathsheba and pointed his finger at David and said, Thou art the man. Remember Nathan had told a parable about a, a, a rich man who had everything. And then he steals his poor neighbor's vineyard. And David said, Find out who that man is and I will have him executed. Thou art the man. You have taken a man's wife for yourself. Man, it takes some guts to be a prophet in the court of a king. And, uh, okay, well, by the way, David was broken. Rochelle knows this. I really feel like God has given me a spirit of prophecy in my old age. I mean, seriously, I turned 60. And I, God took away, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean, I, in my young age, in my young age, 20 years younger than Moses. 15 years younger than Abraham. But I had a pastor's heart. All I cared about were the sick. I just cared about caring for people. It's as if God took that away and gave me a spirit of prophecy. And a prophet is not a real good pastor. So it was time for me to go. Okay. Uh, so after 30 years, I set aside pastoring. And now all I'm doing, and God's opening doors, is I'm giving people the same message you're hearing here. The same message Nathan gave to David. I'm giving it to our state, our nation, and saying, guys, we've got to humble ourselves before Yahweh. All right, now, Nathan, 
is used by God. David is humble. Now we come to this passage, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I want you to take a look at verse 12. This is Nathan speaking. Look at the last portion of verse 11 of 2 Samuel 7. Last one. The Lord declares to you, Yahweh declares to you, King David, that He, Yahweh, will make a house for you. By the way, this is where we get the phrase house of David. Okay? Yahweh's going to do this. Remember, David is king of Israel, so we know the date. Saul became king in 1051. He reigned 40 years. He ended his kingship. He died, killed by the Philistines, in 1011 B.C. David becomes king in 1011 B.C., reigns for 40 years until 971 B.C. When he dies, Solomon his son comes to the throne and builds the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem. David built his palace, but Yahweh wouldn't let him build the temple to Yahweh because he had blood on his hands. So David builds this massive palace for himself while all the people worship around the tent, the tabernacle. And David one time muses or converses with Nathan and says, Nathan, is this right that I, king of Israel, have such a grand palace? And Yahweh has a tent? I want to build a temple. And Yahweh says, no, David, not you. Not you. Okay, well, Nathan and David are buds. After Nathan confronted David and David repented. So listen to what Nathan says. The Lord's going to make a house for you. Verse 12. When your days are complete, that means when you're no longer king and you die, you lie down with your fathers. In the Old Testament, lying down with your fathers means you die and you are buried. When your days are complete, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. I will do it, Yahweh says. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of His kingdom forever. I will be a father to Him. He will be a son to me. When He commits iniquity, I will correct Him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from Him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Now the one verse in there that may throw you is the verse, when he commits iniquity. We don't have time to go over it because we've got to go to Isaiah 11. But Dr. Darnell and I, uh, I think this is a tremendous Hebrew phrase. When did Yeshua, the Messiah, ever commit iniquity? It's iniquity placed on him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, he became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made righteous in him. When Yeshua the Son of God and the Son of Man died on the cross and He went to the grave. Three days later, the Creator says, it's accepted. It's accepted. Now, the house of David will reign forever. Okay. That is the context for Isaiah 11. Let's turn to Isaiah 11 and thank you for your patience. Let's begin reading. Any questions before we do? You jump forward with a question or a comment. We may only get through verse 9 today because of time, but you'll see how beautiful this is. Let's begin. David, any thoughts before we start reading Isaiah 11? This is the passage for every politician. You want to be king, learn this passage. Amen to that. Amen to that. But he says it's a passage for every politician. You want to be king. Hey, before we start reading, let me let me tell you something. Nobody else knows. You'll be the first. Rochelle knows. And that's it. People ask me all the time, are you going to run for Congress again? Okay. I'm going to give you an answer. I don't know yet. But if I do, let me tell you, I'm not going to play the game. I'm not going to raise money from my friends. I'm not going to have a bank account. I'm not going to report to the federal government. 
I might make it known, and I'm just going to ask the Lord to exalt me to a position in Congress. And Rochelle says, wait, you'll never win. Oh, I know. I understand. But you know what? I've seen the game. And it's all about how much money, the influence you can get. It's all about power. And you know, here's the deal. I'll be nice to everyone, but if I ever stand on the floor of Congress, I'll be saying the same thing I'm saying to you. And then they'll haul me off to jail. So here we go. <laughs> Verse 1. Then, when is then? A lot of Hebrew commentators say there is no connection to chapter 10 and chapter 11. None. Assyria, the forest of tall trees, has been wiped out. There's no connection. I disagree. I agree with Doc. I think there's a huge connection. We've just talked about tall trees who think they're L, the Assyrians, that God wipes out. He brings them to stumps. Now he starts talking about a stump. Then a shoot, that's a branch, that's a stem, will spring from the stump of Jesse. Or the stem of Jesse. Don't get caught up in the exactness of the words. If you're a gardener, you understand exactly what this is. If you've got something that you have cut down in the garden, you've cut it down, but you didn't pull the roots out, the next spring or the next spring, whenever, you might see a shoot come from the stump, from the root, something alive, something growing. Who is Jesse? He's the father of David. He's the peasant. He's the shepherd. Now, let me ask you a question. And this is one that David uh, brings up in his commentary, which is really good. Why, why does it not say, Then from the stump of David? David was king. Jesse wasn't. Why does it say Jesse? I think David's point is brilliant. And uh, are, are the cameras on, Bill? Yes, okay, good enough. I don't see a red light on mine. Maybe they don't have red lights anymore. Uh, you might see. Oh, okay, good. Um, why does it say Jesse? Here's why. Are you ready for this? When Yeshua comes, it's not pomp and circumstance. It's not bling and zing. It's not robes and regalty. Yeah. Yeshua, He is like Jesse. Humble. Poor. I think, David, that's why it's Jesse. You, do you agree? Yeah. Alright, let's go on. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Let me pause right here and tell you this. Some Hebrew commentators say, now I don't agree, but I understand where they're coming from. Some Hebrew commentators say that Isaiah 11 was not written by Isaiah. That it was written by someone else after the Jews had been captured by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And now they're coming back to the land of Israel after the Persians released the Jews from Babylonian captivity in 539 B.C. And somebody writes this and says, A shoot is coming from Jesse. Why? Because the kingship of Israel came to an end in 586 B.C. No more kings. With Zedekiah, the line of kings ended. And you know what? You don't read of another king of the Jews until Jesus died on the cross and they made fun of him with the little tag in three languages, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. This is the king of the Jews. Ha, ha, ha. Look at him. 
Are you with me? And by the way, he is the king. He's not the king of the Jews. He's the king of the world. And when you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and Luke, it descends from Jesse. He's the shoot coming out. Questions? Comments? That's just verse 1. Hazel, does it make sense? All right. Does, does the word then point to a time? That's a great question, I mean, Michelle. When the trees are cut, when the low, when the when the mighty are brought low, but that's yeah. very general. Yeah. And it doesn't point to a specific time. Rochelle's question is, when is that time with the word then? And David, I want you to comment. Let me say a word on that, Rochelle. This is one of the reasons why some Hebrew commentators say it is written after the tall tree of the kingships of Judah has been cut down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I personally believe Isaiah wrote this. Isaiah wrote this. Uh, but David, what's your thought on the word then? <laughs> In word then. There we go. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Okay, here's what David said. David says, that it's just the word and in Hebrew. It doesn't, so it's not a timing word, it's just and. ESV oh. leaves it out. Oh, very good. ESV leaves it out. Now, see, this is a brilliant spot to point out the different translations into English. The Hebrew text, which David is reading, just says and. So you begin chapter 11 with, and a shoot will spring from the stump of Jesse. That's it. And. But in English, the word then connotes time. Does that make sense? Edith has a true Bible that says then. Oh, Edith, what translation are you reading from? Her Bible, English Bible, says and. New King James. New King James, by the way, is fantastic. It is. If you love the King James Version, New King James is fantastic. Any other comments or questions? Great questions. All right, go to verse 2. The Spirit of Yahweh will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and strength. The Spirit of knowledge. And the fear of Yahweh. Now, all commentators are in agreement that this is a description of Yeshua, the Messiah. But I also am in agreement with David. It should be descriptive of the spirit of every politician, businessman, father, mother, husband, wife, who knows Yeshua. This should be our spirit. Just like the spirit of Antichrist was in the king of Tyre, the king of Assyria, the kings of northern Israel, those who are of Yahweh should be described like this. Wisdom, understanding, strength, counsel, knowledge, and fear of Yahweh. By the way, the word fear in Hebrew is... When I was a little boy, Hazel, you know, if you were a little girl, you, I, did you ever fear anything under the bed, in the closet, in the house? You know, and maybe you, you couldn't go to sleep and mom or dad would come in and say, listen, there's nothing there. Don't fear. Okay, to tell somebody not to fear, you just can't. It's hard. Okay, but fear here in verse 2, is not that kind of fear. This is, this is reverence. This is awe. Okay, you say, well, what was the fear that I had when like, I was a, a kid? Well, in the Greek, it's called vesovemonia. It's the fear of demons. Uh, it's the fear of evil. It's a foreboding fear. Okay, God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So, those who know Yahweh have this spirit of reverence of Him. Make, make sense? Okay, let's go on. Verse 3. And He will delight in this reverence of Yahweh. And He, look at this now, this should be your spirit. He will not judge by what His eyes see. That is beautiful. Don't judge by what your eyes see. You get in trouble, Edith. The Jews judged who they wanted to be king by what their eyes saw. Saul, big, tall, strong, handsome. D 
Don't judge the world by that. Make sense? By the way, you go to church, you see a good-looking couple come in, dressed to the nine, erect, powerful. Then you see a poor Hispanic walk in. Do you make a judgment by what you see? Make sense? All right, let's go on. He will not judge by what his eye sees, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Oh, for heaven's sake. This should be the banner for CNN. We will not make a decision by what our ears hear. Be a critical thinker. Don't just believe what your ears hear. By the way, you could say that about Fox News too. Same thing. Verse 4. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. By the way, let me let me pause right there. And let's talk about Yeshua striking the earth with the rod of his mouth. In chapter 10, we saw that the king of Assyria was the rod in Yahweh's hand to punish northern Israel. But then Yahweh turns around and judges the rod, Assyria, for their pride. Okay, what is rod? Rod is a staff of discipline. You know, spare the rod. Spoil the child. You with me? It's like a paddle. It's discipline, punishment, correction. The rod, his rod, will strike the earth with his mouth. What is that? Are you ready? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Here's the thing. The judgment on the earth comes from the word of Yeshua. Meaning, you pay attention to His word and you are blessed. You ignore His word. His word becomes your condemnation. Are you with me? Let's go on. Verse 4. With righteousness He'll judge the poor, decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He'll strike the earth with the rod of His mouth and with the breath of His lips He will slay the wicked. Breath of his lips. Remember who Yahweh is. Doc will tell you this. Yeshua is the Greek name for Jesus. Christos is the Greek name for Messiah. Messiah is a title. Yeshua is a name. Yeshua and Yahweh come from the same root. How do you pronounce Yahweh in Hebrew? The Jews today call it the unpronounceable name. I've tried to tell you it is... Let everything that hath breath, it's the sound of breath, praise Yahweh. <coughs> he is the author of our breath. He's the author of life. Notice how this plays in. With the breath of His mouth, His lips, He will slay the wicked. You know, when the Bible says Yeshua holds the keys of life and death, you know what that means? For everyone in this room struggling with cancer or having loved ones struggling with a disease, when he holds the keys of, li of life and death in his hands, it means he holds the power of breath in his lips. Nobody dies. One moment before, one moment after. Yahweh calls him home. Including the wicked. He slays the wicked. And the death of the righteous is a precious thing in his eyes. He takes away your breath and calls you home. Make sense? Let's go on. Verse 5, Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. By the way, the belt in ancient days was what you would do is it would, it would be a sash. It would be made of cloth, not leather. And what you would do is when you're ready to move, you have purpose, you're walking, you would pull up your robes, 
your inner rope, your outer rope, you would pull it up and you would belt it, sash it around your waist so you'd have freedom of movement around your feet. This is a beautiful metaphor of when Yeshua, with purpose, walks the earth. How does He live? Well, He's girded up with righteousness and faithfulness. Everything He does is right, and He will always do it. Well, I think the word righteousness, mm. if you're legalistic, you say, well, you're right. You did right. Mm. But the word righteousness is defined in Isaiah 58 as caring for the poor. Very good. It's, it's, it's the righteousness of God welcomes the immigrant into your home, et cetera, et cetera. It, it isn't a legalistic thing about, well, yes. I kept the letter of the law. No. Yes. Very good. Different. No. I, I, I agree, uh, David. And you know, one of the things David and I have talked about, and by the way, we've got our Kingdom Conference coming up, and David, I, and Tim will be talking about this. Um, the church should be taking care of immigrants and the poor. The church shouldn't have big fancy buildings. We should be going out in the community and caring for the oppressed. Now, the big debate and David and I have talked about this, is does the government act like the church? Right. And does the church act like the government? Right. And what's happened today is there's been a flip on the order of things. I think the church is higher than the government because it's people of an everlasting kingdom. And we should be the most liberal people on the face of the earth. We should be liberal in our acceptance. We should be liberal in our help, our generous with our money. We should put our arms around people. Okay, but from a government perspective, this is a debate. My liberal political friends say the government should be like the church. My conservative political friends say no, the church should be like the government and keep people out. Um, and I'm like, guys, come on. I think you both got it wrong. I think we should be as liberal as the day is long in the church in terms of helping people. But the government has a different purpose. Now, Doc would argue with me, and that's one of the advantages of being in a uh, conference where you don't just hear one opinion. And, and I say this over and over and over again. We'll finish with two verses and we'll quit. Um, always find a spiritual home where more than one opinion is welcome. Because if the leader shuts down other people's opinions, he's acting as if he is L. He is supreme. Even though Dr. Darnell's name is Darn L. Okay? Uh, <laughs> he's got a humble spirit. An incredibly humble spirit. You went learn a bit. Well, we'll see. Yeah, that's what he said. But but he listens, he talks, even if he disagrees. That's where we're at. Make sense? You've got to make up your own mind. Be a critical thinker. But here's the deal. Doc is right. Your spirit ought to be described in this chapter. And so when you go to work today... Just read this chapter. And is this your spirit? All right, let's go on. And we'll finish out verse... You know what? Let's do this. We're out of time. We're going to start with verse 6. And and um, Gene Bundy, we're out of time because I took a very long time to get the context. But we're going to come. We're going to start. I'll send out an email next week with verse 6. Because we're going to come to this famous passage where the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the young goat. We're going to talk about what this is. It's the messianic kingdom. It's, 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 it's when Jesus rules. Now, I'll tell you this. I personally think it's heaven. And I'm going to blow your mind. I think heaven, and Doc agrees with me on this, I think heaven is this earth with the curse reversed. I think 
Heaven and earth unite. You're given a home. And then, now get this now. You enjoy the earth the way it was intended. Mm -hmm. A paradise. And the lion will lay down with the lamb. And you will have fellowship with everyone. Rochelle and I will be best friends forever. And, you know, we're husband and wife. And we're like, you know, I, I, I did a wedding one time when the woman married her fourth husband because the previous three had died. And the question was, whose wife will she be in heaven? And my response was the response of Jesus. In the resurrection, there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage. If she is my best friend, it doesn't mean we lose that. It means all other relationships are elevated to best friend. Can you imagine just enjoying fellowship? Now, here's where I'm going to blow your mind. And um, Carrie, I don't know if your sister's listening, but I sure love her comment on this. Okay, if you are, and if you are, your note to me listening was incredible. Thank you for your encouragement. Why do you think God created the universe? I think He is going to give it to His people as an inheritance. And I think what you'll do in the eternal realm is explore the universe. Star Trek has nothing on you. <laughs> Guys, think about that. The universe is infinite. I'm telling you, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has the heart been prepared to understand and know the things God has prepared for those who love Him. <coughs> There'll be no preachers in the resurrection, There'll be no policemen in the resurrection. There'll be no soldiers in the resurrection. But there will be artists and builders and gardeners and construction of cities. There'll be no death, no tears. That's what we're going to read about when we come back next week. Okay, I can't tell if you're really bored <laughs> or... If you understood, did you understand a little bit? All right. Hope you have a great week. Those of you watching, thank you so much. God bless you. We'll see you next Friday for Isaiah 11, 6. And I promise you, we will finish the chapter next week. God bless you.